Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. Welcome to the Open to Hope Show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host. Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, we are so honored to have our guest on today, aren't we? He's an amazing researcher, an amazing person, and talk a little bit about all of his accomplishments and who he is. Okay, we are being joined here today with our guest, Dr. Andy Ho. He is a professor, an award-winning social scientist, an educator, and a psychologist, just to name a few. He is on the board of directors for the International Work Group on Death, Dying, and Bereavement, and he is past president of the board of directors for the Association for Death Education and Counseling, known as ADAC. Welcome to the show, Andy. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. It's great to have you in from Singapore. Well, you know, you've been in the field of working with people um, in the death and dying area for many years, right? How did you get into it originally? Well, it's, it's an interesting um, journey. I started out as a researcher looking at uh, family dynamics. I was uh, trained as a marriage and family therapist, um, but I end up doing a lot of research looking at uh, intergenerational relationship and then looking at um, family policy. And from family research, I moved into aging research and then from aging research, naturally progressing into end of life care research. Mm -hmm. um, I met my mentor then, Professor Cecilia Chen from the University of Hong Kong. And um, she eventually became my uh, supervisor for my PhD. So that was a, a transition and a journey that I've taken since early 2000s. We were talking uh, before the show with you about the fact that there are so many things you could talk about and and help people with. And I know we've got a lot of people here who are in pretty early bereavement, probably the first or second year. And I wondered uh, what your thoughts were, um, your major things in your research that you think could be helpful for people. Well, yeah, I mean, we've created a number of intervention here in Singapore, looking at um, creating something that's more culturally specific and um, able to target local population. But I think grief is a universal experience. So whatever we created here in Singapore, I think it's applicable to people around the world. So one of the intervention that we created is called Family Dignity Intervention. And that's really looking at uh, supporting dying patients at the final days of life. And for many patients that I worked with, um, there are not you know, it's not so much about fearing about the dying process or what happens to them after death, but they're more afraid of not having, you know, achieve something that they want to be able to achieve or thinking that their life is not worthwhile because they become so dependent at the last days of life. And so the intervention is really to help them revisit important chapters and memories that they have and focusing specifically with the relationship that they have created throughout the lifetime, especially with their family caregiver as well as the immediate family. So the intervention is not an individual psychotherapy, but more of a family-based type of therapy that provide a platform for patients to talk about their lives, their experiences, their achievement, um, and, and with the presence of the family so that they can have that chance to listen to the life of, of the loved one, um, chime in and, and fill in those memories and provide more, uh, more, more information. And, and at the end of the day, those conversations are recorded, transcribed, and put into a legacy document that sort of tell the life story of this patient. And, the, and then the book storybook, the legacy document is then bestowed upon the patient as well as the family member. And so what we discovered is that while this intervention was very helpful for the patient as they were able to find hope, they were able to have better quality of life at the end of life. When a patient passes on, that document and that experience of having that conversation provided the, the chance for the surviving family member um, to have something to hold on to. Um, they're able to remember the loved one, um, their, those wisdom, those, those those narrative and those experiences help them to cope the grief a lot better. And so what we were able to find out was that um, grief support shouldn't really just happen after the, the loss has happened. It should happen even when the person is still alive. And by creating those beautiful memories, it really helped with the bereavement process. I love so, it. So Andy, I'm thinking, Mom, for those that haven't done it before that somebody died, it sounds like they could still create this this document and this legacy after people could get together, share stories, record them, and create this legacy if they hadn't done so prior to the death. Certainly, I think that that certainly can be done, um, and, and having a more structured way of having a, that type of conversation because you can talk about so many different things, yeah. um, but if we can structure in a way that look look at our life in different chapters, such as childhood, such as growing up 
career, family, retirement, you know, having a more standardized structure way of having those discussion and even including pictures and memorabilia is that that type of conversation could, I think, would be very helpful for people. Yeah. Uh, what a wonderful legacy to, mm -hmm. to uh, pass on to grandchildren and great grandchildren about who this person had been in your life. I love that idea. And it sounds like anytime a family got together or with the internet now, we can certainly, uh, do things like that. That's, that's a wonderful idea. You know, and I, you know, you were saying that um, people, the patient may feel that they haven't uh, had the life that they thought they wanted. I think um, a lot of times after a death, the family is concerned that they didn't handle it right, or somebody didn't do this, or somebody didn't do that. And creating mm -hmm. those stories could help to get you by uh, through that and by that, you know. Yeah, I think something that we discovered along the way is that um, I know around the world, we've been talking a lot about advanced care planning, and which is such a difficult conversation to have when people are asked to make decision about their care. Um, it's it's difficult in the West, it's even more difficult in the, in the East because of our death taboos and the fear of death. Mm -hmm. But what was magical about the FDI is that when we talk about what's important to a patient when they're still alive, the things that they value, what's important to them, um, organically, those conversations about how I want to be cared for, how I want my funeral to look like, those things just naturally emerge in our conversation. And that being able to have those conversations and make those decisions in the presence of the family member reduces the burden that it has on the family. Because oftentimes patients don't tell what, what they want and they don't tell their family how they want to be cared for or what happens after the, you know, after the death. And so when the family's there listening to their wishes, they would be able to know exactly what to do, how to provide support, and how to arrange the funeral in a way that respect their loved ones. Now, we were talking a little bit about um, caregivers, uh, professionals. I think that's an important discussion because I think we neglect the fact how difficult it is sometimes to take care of patients or family members and then have them pass away, and there's kind of not the acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think for a lot of professional caregiver, they have to spend a lot of time and effort and energy to be able to establish that working relationship with the patient. They need to establish rapport, trust, uh, and they've part of become a family, really. And when the patient passes away, it's almost as if part of their family pass away too, but they don't get the chance to spend time, mourn, and, and grieve properly. In fact, they maybe spent a few minutes um, uh, spending the last office of the patient and that's it and they have to move on to the next patient and then they sort of you know sweep it under the rug they have to put up that professional front they can't show vulnerability and because of that a lot of those grief are unresolved and it can lead to a great deal of burnt out more distressed and it's not surprising that burnt out amongst healthcare professional is probably one of the highest amongst all industry in the world and especially with COVID-19, we've seen that the healthcare industry has experienced great uh, resonation, a great turnover, mm -hmm. and, and that has a lot to do, I believe, to unresolved grief. Uh, what, what do you suggest as interventions for people who are feeling that burnout? Well, I think it's important for us to have an opportunity to, to talk about what we've gone through, but sometimes grief can be so profound um, that words cannot describe it, especially for healthcare workers. They, they're they not used to displaying vulnerability or talking about what they've gone through. And so what we've done in Singapore is we created something called Mindful Compassion Art Based Therapy, MCAT for short. And this is an intervention that integrates the reflective power of mindfulness meditation and the expressive power of art-based art based therapy so that they can actually reflect what's gone on in their lives. And then instead of using words to describe their experiences, we ask them to create a piece of art that tell their story. And once we're able to create something that allows us to express the intangible, our feelings are often intangible, but we can create a piece of art, a sculpture or a, a 2D uh, art piece, then I can create uh, the intangible, no, make the intangible tangible. And, and so when they see something that they can actually feel and touch and they can describe, they can tell their story a lot better. Um, we were able to create or develop a randomized control trial with more than 68 professional in Singapore and actually extended that study to family caregiver of dementia patient as well. And we discovered that a six week intervention that using art as a medium to tell a story and using mindfulness meditation to reflect on their experience was able to reduce significantly burnt out, increase resilience, 
the emotional regulation and also their quality of life. And so I, I love like I love this, Andy. I, I love the idea of using art. You hear about it a lot when you're working with children, but we don't talk about it enough. The fact that, like you're saying, you can you, adults can use it also. So is it yes. painting? Is it drawing? Is it sculpture? I mean, what kind of art are we talking about that people are utilizing? To oh, it's, help it's them? really simple. We we give them a wide spectrum of mediums. So we give them watercolor, okay. acrylic. We give them you know magazines so they can do collage if not comfortable. Um, we give mm -hmm. them clay. Uh, so so it's really a wide spectrum of material. And and you're right. It's often quite difficult for adults to say, "Hey, I haven't done this since high school. Like that, this twenty years since I pick up a paintbrush." And so they could potentially feel quite intimidated by the notion of creating art. But that's where I think that's where the the art therapy element comes into play. That's where the facilitation comes into play is to be able to uh, guide someone and encourage someone to pick up a paintbrush. You know, pick up a pair of scissors and cut out images that you think describe your emotion here. Uh, and, and that can, uh, and, and by week by week, people would be able to be more open and to be more receptive towards, um, towards the process of art creation. And when they're able to see you know, their feelings, their stories being, being captured by a piece of art and to be able to tell that story, it helps them to heal. It helps them to find catharsis. Right. And sometimes there are no words. And when you do art, you're able to access deep emotions and be able to access even some of the way that you're feeling and thinking about the death which For I sure. also love. I'm just, I just had another question. You know, you're, you're a, a, a world leader in grief and loss and, and through everything that you've learned over the years, how, what have you taken away as far as how people find hope again? What have you learned about that after a death? Well, finding hope, I think um, after a death, it's, it's, you know, losing someone close to us is definitely a devastating event. No matter how good the relationship is, it's still filled with sorrow and sadness. Um, but being able to, you know, not just see the death as, as, as a loss, but to be able to see, you know, my loved one passing away as a way of graduating from life um, and to be able to, you know, really appreciate and, and learn from that person's life. What are some of the things that they're really appreciative of? What have they learned from their failures? What have they achieved? What have they, um, what are some of the wisdom that they have? And being able to, pick up those values and wisdom and embody it into our own lives and to live it, live out a life according to some of those principles. Um, so we're carrying on the legacy of our diseased loved one into our own experiences. I think that type of transformation and perspective change um, can be very motivating and energizing for someone who's, who's grieving. Yeah. Well, Andy Ho, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been amazing. And you are just a fountain of, uh, wealth and information and i'm sure people can go on line and find you and read about some of the things that you've done and thank you for all the gifts that you give to the world well thank you for having me it's a it's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be speaking to both of you yes i agree with what my mother has said andy thank you for making this your life's work you truly have made a huge mark on the world on what with what you are doing with grief loss hope and healing and we are glad that our paths have crossed Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us on the show today. And Heidi and I always want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own and God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.